a lot of work. I'll just, I'll, let's give him a round of applause when we go in there. Um, that was my thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so my phone's off. All right, go ahead and uh, when you're ready there. Good evening. Welcome to the first candidate forum for position two on the Deschutes County Board of Commissioners. This forum is organized by Connect Central Oregon and hosted in partnership with the Bulletin and EO Media. Now, the people beside, behind the scenes don't always get recognized, so we would like to start out with giving them a round of applause for all the work that they have done to set this up this evening to inform us. So thank you guys. This is a nonpartisan race, which means residents, no matter their party or affiliation or non-affiliation, can vote in the May 21st election. Candidates will start with brief remarks and engage in a conversational dialogue with questions from the community filtered through tonight's moderators. There is no hard time limit to the answers, but moderators will chime in to keep candidates on topic and keep the conversation moving. We'd like it to be more of a conversational um, dialogue between the candidates. We hope to open a conversational tone that will help us move past sound bites and help voters get a better understanding of all of the candidates this evening. We will take a 10 minute break at 7 p.m. and gather, for, gather the audience questions, and we promise to finish up by eight. Our moderators tonight are former county commissioner, Ellen Unger, myself, former state representative, Sherry Helt, and Redmond spokesman editor Tim Trainer. All candidates filed for the seat are here also. Incumbent Phil Chang and challengers Brian Hunt Huntimer. Huntimer. Sorry, I didn't want to get it right. right. I wanted to get it right. Um, Robert Clark and Imhoff, Judy Ch and Judy Trago. Please take a moment for each of you to introduce yourselves. We'll do that um, rather quickly, sort of like a voter's pamphlet introduction, if you will. Um, and we'll start from this end of the table with Judy and um, move down to Brian. Okay, great. Thank, thank you all for coming. I would like to thank Central Oregon and Connects, Scott and Jim Fitster for setting this up. They do a lot of this, and so I really appreciate their efforts tonight. My name is Judy Trago, and I am the current executive director for the Sisters Area Chamber of Commerce. Can we fix the voice? So as we mentioned at the beginning, uh, we're working on that as we speak, so bear with it. We appreciate your accommodation temporarily. Okay, just for now. I appreciate that. It's not that. confrontational. It was only a uh, That's okay. Thank you for asking. We love hearing you. Thank you. I am a bit of a goer on her, so the echo will help me keep it short. My name is Judy Trago, and I am the current executive director for the Sisters Area Chamber of Commerce. I am the president and founder of the Sisters Community Foundation. Prior to that, I was an elected official. I was elected to the Sisters City Council and appointed council president by the city council. Prior to that, I worked for an Oregon State Senator, and he had Southern Oregon, so I served constituents in Deschutes County, Crook County, Lake County, and Klamath County, and Jackson County. And I read every bill that proposed during legislative session for him, and I was a liaison between constituents and that were having roadblocks and red tape with government agencies. Prior to that, I worked for Congressman Greg Walden in his Bend District office, um, providing constituent services in Central, Eastern, and Southern Oregon. I am a longtime volunteer in the community. I currently serve on the Budget Committee, and prior to that, I was the Vice President of the Central Oregon Intergovernmental Council. I was the President for the Heart of Oregon Core Board. Unfortunately, when Dennis Maloney passed away, I was vice president and that made me the president of the Heart of Oregon Core, a board I sat on for eight years. And on the Commission and Children and Families and the list goes on and on of the volunteer work as you all do in your community as well. I'm happy to be here tonight. I want to run for county commissioner because I feel I have the qualifications, the skills, and the temperament to do the job. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, thank you all, uh, especially the organizers, for joining us tonight for this forum to talk about this very important position. So uh, my name is Phil Chang. I, uh, it's been my honor for the last three years to serve as your county commissioner. And uh, I'm a 20-year resident of Deschutes County prior to uh, becoming commissioner. I, I worked for many years. I, I served our community for many years uh, helping to ensure that our farms and our rivers have enough water uh, and that our uh, and working to make our forests both healthier and less of a threat uh, in terms of wildfire to our homes. Since I've been commissioner, um, we've made a lot of progress and uh, we've accomplished a lot in the realms of housing, child care, uh, land and water conservation, mental health, uh, and preserving our quality of life here in Deschutes County. I'd like to be reelected, and I can promise you that we will make even more progress in a second term. Thanks. Make sure they can hear me. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Rob Imhoff, and uh, I am running to fill the seat uh, for position number two for county commissioner. Um, as a native Oregonian, I have um, raised my children here. Um, not only been raised here, raised my children here, and now watching my grandchildren raised here in Deschutes County. Uh, there's a lot of things that are going wrong with our county. There's a lot of things that are going right with our county. I think what we need to have in a county commissioner is someone who works well with others. Um, and I think that I am the right person to fit that role. Um, as far as why I'm running, I would tell you that um, I'm very passionate in leaving a legacy for my children and my grandchildren. And what I see happening in Deschutes County is that legacy and the ability to leave that legacy starting to get diminished more and more each day. Whether that be with our water and our timber resources, whether that be being overrun by homelessness on our public ground, whether that be um, some of our state's policies on, on drug addiction and mental health and as it relates to homelessness. Um, I can tell you that, that I'm a fighter by nature, but I'm also a deal maker. And I think that what you have to have to do this position the correct way and get the most done is you have to make connections with people, assume that every single person has the best intentions, and try to get the most done in the shortest amount of time so that you're efficient. As a business owner in Bend, I can tell you that I've run my own business for 22 years. I've also coached for 23 years. I've coached everything from kindergarten up to varsity, um, basketball, baseball, football, and golf. I've coached a lot of people's kids. Um, hopefully did a good job. Most of the reports I get back anyway are that I did a good job. But I love kids. And I see the future for our children uh, getting dimmer and dimmer. And so that's really what drives my passion. Um, I, and I love people. And I think that um, what we need is, is a happy and joyful warrior and um, that's what I intend to do. Hi, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Can you hear me? All right. Yep. Hi, my name is Brian Adamer. I'm a longtime resident of Central Oregon. Originally came up here in 1978 with my family. Uh, And uh, I've had a lot of personal experience in this area. I've built homes, I've sold homes, I've 
two knees in place. And I had a shoulder in place. But I'll tell you what, all those things that were going on at that time really gave me an inspiration that I wanted to do something. I wanted to, I wanted to make an impact. service to people in this town. And I can I can help in public safety, in mitigation of drug and alcohol abuse, child abuse. This whole nation has has got a situation where the kids are in crisis. So with that Thanks. It was great to meet all four of you. Thanks all for uh, participating. And we also thank, yes? May I ask you, uh, we're actually going to take a brief pause. Okay. We, we, I, I typed it out in the chat. We're going to replace a cable. Okay. We should be able to get the audio corrected. We're aware of what the problem is, but we do agree. Uh, we want to improve the audio for the people in the audience. So give us one moment before we get into the questions, and you should be able to roll. So bear with us for a moment. Sure. Thank you.
Okay, so sounds great. Uh, thanks, folks, for being flexible. Thanks to all candidates for being here. Also, thanks to the audience, uh, both in person and online. Folks online are welcome to submit questions during this forum to the email decision at connectcentraloregon.org. Uh, folks here can handwrite questions, deliver them to the folks in the back, and we'll ask as many as possible, especially during our second hour after we do a quick break. Um, we hope this will this forum will benefit voters, um, but for us, all of us to learn about the candidates, we need to be able to hear their answers. Um, so let's uh, try to let them speak, uh, don't interrupt, and uh, don't limit conversation. Uh, moderators will halt all discussion um, if those candidates can't be heard, as, as we've already done. So uh, thank you, and without further ado, let's get to our questions. Alan, would you start us off? Sure, the first question. The first question I'd like to ask is about relationships. Now we're in Deschutes County. We've got four cities. The, uh, the councilors and mayors of those cities are volunteers. Uh, you are elected full-time paid people. Uh, we need you to speak with the, with the people who we work with at the county, the congressional delegation, the Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, the Bureau of Reclamation, and then at the state level with the governor's office, with the legislature, and with the agencies that uh, the county works with because the county provides services with parole and probation and the health department and those sort of things. If you have a relationship with those groups, I'd like to know how is that relationship going? And if you don't have a relationship, how do you plan to develop that relationship? And we'll start with Phil. Um, the thing about county government is the county is involved in just about everything, um, from, from housing to health services uh, to um, the criminal justice system to rehabilitating criminals to uh, child care to providing health care uh, health services in schools. Um, so to be an effective county commissioner, you need to have relationships with a lot of people. Um, and you need to know how to work with those people. Um, and I had many of those relationships prior to coming into office. And I have only built upon those uh, while I've been in office. Um, there are all kinds of people who want the county to do things, um, and uh, you know, sometimes they want the county to do things because uh, it, it benefits them in a in a very specific way. Sometimes they want the county to do things uh, for the good of the, the good of everyone. Um, and I have worked with 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 both parts. Um, I I really like to focus on what benefits everyone, and. Um, you know, when, when I can, to weave that together with people's kind of specific individual interests, because oftentimes you can do that. Before coming into office, uh, I spent many years doing collaborative natural resource management. So uh, basically, um, that's, that's doing things like getting farmers and fish lovers uh, and cities together and having them figure out uh, how they could all get what they need out of our limited water resources. Um, or, for example, uh, in the world of forest management, uh, we had people who wanted timber, we had people who wanted habitat, we had one, people who wanted the, the, the forest not to burn their house down. Um, and I spent, again, many years bringing all those people together and making sure that um, we could get all of those things. Uh, out of out of our forests, and that's uh, that's a lot of the work that you see being implemented in our national forests right now. That collaborative agreement that I helped to build. Um, I, you know, uh, since I've been in office, those collaborative relationships have resulted in things like hundreds more uh, child care slots available in our community through investments in facilities and our our child care workforce. Uh, they have resulted in things like hundreds more affordable housing units available in our community um, through relationships with affordable housing developers uh, and uh, funders of, of such projects. Um, so I do have uh, many of the relationships that, uh, that um, former Commissioner Unger uh, just mentioned. 
Um, I, I, you know, since he started with city councils, I would, I would just also note that um, uh, I am guessing that uh, up here uh, on this panel, uh, I have, uh, I have endorsements from more city councilors than any of my uh, challengers, um, and I would say that that is a product of the relationships I have, the good working relationships I have with people. They know that when they, they need the county to do things, when they need the county to listen to them, um, that they can count on me. And that's, that's where those endorsements come from. Thanks. Rob. So relationships, my dad used to say, everything comes down to relationship. Doesn't matter if you're in business, doesn't matter if you're uh, an athlete, doesn't matter if you're on a, uh, in, in a club or part of a group, the relationships you have that's what gives you the benefit of the doubt and allows people to trust in your intentions. I built my entire career that way. I built my entire business that way. And I want to be a bridge builder. Um, in terms of specific relationships as they would relate to a county commissioner, um, I have already had some uh, discussions with some high level people uh, with regards to um, like some of the suit space and hydrologists. Um, which obviously impacts our water management. Um, last night I was at a forum from one of the leading experts in, in uh, wolf depredation um, in, in the state and uh, uh, nationally as well. Um, and and it, the effect and impact on our other wildlife that we're trying so hard to, to uh, retain. Um, as far as timber management, my, my father was a forestry major at Cal Berkeley. Um, and so what I'll tell you is I spent a lot of my formative years, my dad teaching me things that I didn't think I ever wanted to know about pine cones and deciduous trees and wildfire risk, although it wasn't quite the risk when I was growing up that it is today. Um, as farmers, ranchers, um, you know, I, I carry uh, an endorsement of a very important farm bureau. Um, why? Because I understand and relate to farmers and I'm, not, I'm willing to have a conversation, not be closed off to uh, with any bias that I've come to the table with. I don't pretend to be the expert in the room. I don't in intend to, to educate people um, that are experts in the room. Um, I wanna learn from them. And so if, I think if, you, if we go with that humility and we go with an attitude of stewardship as the basis of why we do what we do, I think that's the path forward. That's the way to build the relationships with any of the, the partners that we need to partner with, whether it's state and federal agencies or whether it's the people that, that fall below our purview um, as county commissioners. That's fine. Thank you. Collaboration is uh, very important to me. And I think that it needs to be a collaboration between the, the county, the state, government, and mostly, mostly with the people. They're the ones that are affected by these decisions that we make. And first and foremost, I've listened to the people. What is it that you need? What is it that you want? And that's when I will talk to county offices and people within the county and discuss, you know, what is it that the people need? How can we move forward with these needs and where it becomes the benefit benefit of the citizen and i've worked a lot in other industries this is the first time that i have ever ran for a public office i find that it's a privilege i'm glad that i'm here i'm here with a lot of fine co-candidates here and uh so I appreciate that too. Um, but I did learn a lot about working with others in the military. And uh, it was a little bit more of there's the chain of command and you know you follow orders. But it's a collaboration of sorts. And then in construction, uh, if you wanna have an unhappy homeowner when you build a house, <laughs> you do you don't talk to them, and uh, that can create a lot of problems. Same with real estate. I'm not doing this anymore. 
you have fiduciaries. Fiduciary is a very important word, and that, that is your bond that you're going to represent that person, and you're going to follow through to the best of your ability. And you're not going to, when you make a decision, you're not going to leave them out of it. You're going to let them know what's going on. That's what's important. And then I'll work with the powers of our local government so we can find the right solution of benefit to the citizens. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Judy. Thanks for the question. I excel at building relationships. We actually received an $11.7 million grant about 20 years ago and built community action teams in each of the communities in Central Oregon. The partnership was housed in Redmond and I worked in the sister's office. There was a Bend office, a Lapine office, Warm Springs, and so we came together to write a strategic plan that would help address the root causes of poverty. And although we all did different projects, we had 120 projects going on at one time, and we were able to build relationships together. And I think that was an awesome way. Alan was a community advocate in Redmond when I was the community advocate in Sisters. I've been here 30 years, and I live in Bend, but I've done a lot of work in Sisters. I've been in Bend for 15 years. Thank you. I've been in Bend for 15 years, but I lived in Sisters for 15 years and commuted to Bend for work. And now I live in Bend and commute back to Sisters for work. So I can't get my commute straight. But that was my toe in the water on building relationships. So that was at the local level, working with Christy Otney when they incorporated Lapine, working with Redmond. Lapine also created a newspaper. Sisters was working on trails and affordable housing. So the community action team of Sisters was the catalyst to providing the Tamarack Village, which is our affordable housing complex in Sisters. And so that's at the local level. At the city level, I've obviously been on a city council, so I know what it takes to work with city councilors and how to get things done. At the statewide level, the minute Representative Levy got elected, I invited her to Sisters and got all the businesses together to meet with her, took her on a tour of Sisters. When Rep Chavez Deremer first got elected, I invited her to Sisters, and we did a roundtable with businesses to see what their challenges were and give her a to-do list to take back to Washington, D.C. to see if she can help small businesses. I also, I do know um, Congressman Benz. I don't know him well. He was in the state capitol when I was there. But I do know him, and I know if I pick up the phone um, and call his chief of staff, his chief, chief of staff always answers, so I believe I can get answers from him. And at the statewide level, I, I also was able to successfully go over with a county commissioner to the Capitol and lobby for $15 million for the courthouse expansion, and we were successful in doing that when no one said we would get the money. Everyone said, you're not getting the money, you're never getting it, it's not coming through, and we were, go we were able to go over there and explain the situation and receive 15. Now, the courthouse is gonna cost $40 million, probably more, so it's a portion of what the county needs but we're gonna to continue to lobby for those funds and, per, and really make the case to the state that these are shared services. So we need funding from the state for these shared services that are provided between the county and the state. Thank you, all of you. Uh, we were gonna do follow-ups. You had very good answers, but if you have a couple sentence follow-ups, uh, start with Phil, run around, yeah, I, I did, uh, um, I, I didn't talk about relationships with legislators. Um, you know, Judy, Judy gave some good examples. I, I just wanted to share a couple of examples of things that uh, have, I, I've been helped to, I've been able to help deliver 
with our state and federal legislators in, in the last few years. Um, so a couple of examples are, um, uh, I, I testified uh, four times in my first year in office on uh, the, the omnibus wildfire package going through the state legislature built uh, a really great relationship with Senator Jeff Golden from the, the Rogue Valley. Uh, and that program, that bill has now delivered uh, over $10 million of funds for uh, private land fuels reduction treatments in our com community. It's also delivered uh, the Oregon Conservation Corps program uh, to, uh, to Central Oregon, which engages local youth uh, trains them and uh, gets them on a career track um, for firefighting or wildland fire or, or forest management. Uh, and in the process, uh, those youth implement uh, fuels reduction treatments, defensible space around uh, disadvantaged uh, people's homes in our community. Think uh, seniors living on a fixed income who can't go out and limb up their trees themselves. Uh, so. Uh, they've they've helped many many you know close to a hundred homeowners uh, in Deschutes County uh, with getting those those treatments done um, and those will make a real difference if, if fire arrives at those people's homes uh, on the congressional level you know one one thing I would uh, you know a couple things I would mention um, are uh, by working with senators uh, Merkley and Wyden I was able to help the Lapine Community Health Center secure uh, uh, $3 million um, to e help expand the, the, the health center. It's under construction right now in Lapine. It'll be the only three-story building in, in the community. Um, and that expansion is going to allow um, that federally qualified health clinic to provide a huge additional range of services in South County that they haven't been able to provide to um, people who are on, on Medicaid or you know uh, potentially uninsured in the past. So really helping to shore up our health care system. So there's just a couple of examples of working with federal and state legislators. Thank you, Dan. Rob, do you have something? I do, <clears throat> but should I say it? Um, I will keep it extremely brief. Uh, I would just say it sounds a lot like there is a heavy reliance on grants and additional funding that comes from the state and the federal level. Um, nothing's free. Money comes from somewhere. And the only way it comes is through taxation. It's the only way to generate money as a government. So I feel like we just need to be very mindful of, uh, again, I go back to stewardship, but we need to be mindful of using those dollars and maximizing those dollars through, to your point, relationships. Um, as a subcontractor, I've built, I've spent a long time building relationships with general contractors and subcontractors on the commercial and residential side that I think um, are worthy partners to find private solutions to public problems. Um, whether that be, you know, everything from the situation that we're dealing with water, whether it's timber management, um, there, there, I think people deep down, every single person that's in this room wants to be a good citizen of Deschutes County. And they want to be a responsible citizen of Deschutes County. And they don't mind giving as long as there's buy-in from everybody. So really, to me, to my point, the relationship side of it, what it does more than anything else is it creates buy-in. Because as a team, you can accomplish much more than you can individually. And it hopefully would allow us as a county to become less reliant on outside funds from other taxpayers in the state or in the United States to get work done here. Thank you. Yeah. Brian. Yes. Um, one thing in particular that I have noticed over the years, and especially in the last couple of years, how prices of everything have gone up. And that includes people not being able to afford a home. Um, recently, I heard on the news, a newscast, that they were contemplating upping the fees for building permits and basing those fees on the amount of the cost of that building. And every dollar that goes up, it makes that 
much higher percentage of people that can't afford to get into a new home. And here's another thing. They're going to get a loan that's also going to, on that home, that's also going to include the, the fees, the permit fees, the filing fees, the planning fees, and on and on that goes. And if you put that on that loan, those people, those young people that are just starting out are going to be paying for that for the next 15 to 30 years, depending upon the term of their mortgage. We don't know what interest rates are going to be. We don't know what they're going to be in the next two weeks. Um, and the Fed, Fed is always talking about, well, we're going to raise the rates. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Inevitably, they raise them. And uh, so I don't want to leave my, my legacy. My, I have grandchildren, the oldest. She's in the nursing program here at St. Charles. She's 23. She's not a homeowner yet, but she's thinking about it. And I don't want to see her get into something where she pays so much money that she can't afford to do it. I know that right now it's cheaper in Bend to rent than it is to pay the mortgage on a median priced home. Now that's, that's not right. And we do have to think about the future and we do have to think about you get what you pay for or you pay for what you get and especially in this case, that in the long run, that's what's, what's going to happen. Thank you. <clears throat> Judy. I've spent the last 22 years working to reduce poverty in Central Oregon. And I do want to say that dirt, you do need to build public-private partnerships. I want to echo what Rob said. The county cannot do these things alone. The nonprofit sector cannot do these things alone. The private sector cannot do these things alone. We need to work together to accomplish getting shelters, getting affordable and workforce housing. We need to have more mental health services. There's a lot of things that we can work on with the public and private sector in cooperation and coordination. Thank you. I got a quick question here that I think we can get through. Um, what's the right, uh, we'll start with you, Mr. Imhoff. Uh, what's the right number of county commissioners uh, for the board to be at its most effective and most responsive to residents? I prepared residents? for this one. Yeah, tell us one. what you think. <laughs> All right, so I do know that there's been a lot of discussion whether we should have five commissioners or three. Um, there are counties that are bigger than us that have three. There's counties that are smaller than us that have five. So the number really becomes a function of how does that commission represent the county? So I live in Bend, but I am expected and plan to be a commissioner for the entire county. What I would expect as a Bend resident is that I would have someone in each of the geographic locations, so it would go north, south, east, west, and central. And each, I don't know how it gets bordered, I don't know how you determine those, I don't know if it's population determined or geographically, but I do think that if you have five that represent every corner of the county, that guarantees, and then truthfully, the ballots that go out to who you vote for, they're based on the, the, the area you live, you're voting for your commissioner for that location. I think that that's gonna give us likely, if we went to five, the most, uh, the, 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 um, most balanced approach to how to, to uh, run Deschutes County. Um, if it stays three, um, I intend to be a commissioner for all of Deschutes County. Um, I'm not, I, I, I um, agree with some things in Bend and I disagree with some things in Bend. Um, I agree with some things in Redmond, I disagree with some things in Redmond. I, it's sisters, you know, Terrebonne, Tumalo, mm -hmm. uh, like Sub Lapine, it just doesn't matter where you are in the county. Everybody's got an opinion about certain issues and they're, most people are not afraid to share it. Um, what I'll tell you is that, that just because my opinion is A doesn't mean that opinion B is wrong. Um, we just got to get to the truth of it, settle it out, flush it out, talk it out, do it in an agreeable way because we can disagree without being disagreeable. And at the end of the day, 
hey, how, how can I honor you if we disagree? How can you honor me if we disagree? Because if we're both working on honoring each other and we're both working towards the same goal, we're gonna get a lot of stuff done even if we disagree philosophically on a lot of other issues. Great, thank you. Yes. Sean Tamer, what, what's the right size of county commissioners? You're up. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, first of all, I agree a lot with what you had to say. And uh, there is a few things that I really feel strongly about. One is that going back to what I said a few minutes ago about paring down, getting some of these costs down, adding in a couple of commissioners is going to raise the costs. So it may mean that three commissioners are going to have to do a little bit more work. They are going to have to represent the entire Deschutes County, but that's okay. Um, I was talking about building permits and long-term costs of housing a little bit ago. And if you take the same Let's take the building department, and you're able to streamline those plans. And there are certain things, I know, because I've been a builder for 30, 40 years, there's a lot of things in there that are approved. Connectors, building components, your spans, all of those things are calculated by engineers. And you can walk right through the county building department and make attachments to those and you can streamline that process you can streamline the time that it takes and you can save save money but what money are you saving you're saving the homeowner money that they don't have to pay for for a long time to come and so as getting back to the numbers I think that we can be really effective with what we have right now. Great. Thank you. Judy. So there's an effort to collect signatures to put on the ballot to have five county commissioners. My concern about that is geographic as well. You do not want five county commissioners from Sisters or five county commissioners from Redmond. And the other comment that I would make on it is I haven't heard from any of the outlying communities, Terrebonne, Tumalo, uh, Sisters, any of those locations in the rural parts of the county that they feel like they're being underrepresented. Now maybe they do feel that way, but I have not heard that and I get around quite a bit with my volunteer work and the work I do in communities. So. If the voters vote for that, I'm obviously going to support it. I hope there's a provision where we can have one for each area representing all of Deschutes County. And I'm going to support that if the voters vote for it. But I am not in favor of having uh, five county commissioners at this time. Maybe we're big enough. Maybe we're not. I don't know. It's 200,000 people now. Can you believe that already? And some folks would say they want zero commissioners. So <laughs> um, I'm not sure about five. I don't, I don't think right now is the time for that. Commissioner Chang. Uh, for me, this is, a, this is a question of access and representation. Uh, right now we have three commissioners. They are all at large. Um, I do my very best to be in touch with everyone across Deschutes County represent everyone across Deschutes County, but I can tell you that um, people are not as well represented as they could be uh, if, number one, we had more commissioners, and number two, I actually agree with, um, with my opponents here that uh, it would be great to have them those uh, commissioner seats districted. And I'll give you, uh, the example I'll give you is uh, a, a county that is much smaller population than ours, uh, also, I think, a very well-governed county, um, Hood River County. Hood River County has about 40,000 people. They have five commissioners. Four of the seats are districted, so representing specific sub-geographies of, of Hood River County, and the fifth one is an at-large chair. Um, 
So each commissioner is responsible for, responsive to 10,000 people. Uh, each of the, your three Deschutes County commissioners needs to be responsible for, responsive to 210,000 people. Um, and I just can't talk to 210,000 people a year. Um, so I, I wish I could, uh, and I do my best to, to, to sense the community as much as I can, um, but we have our limits, and we don't have individual staff connected to commissioners, so really it, it's, it's pretty difficult. Um, so I would say those, the people in Hood River County have much better access to their county commissioners. They can contact them anytime they want, know that they're gonna be responsive, know that they're gonna have uh, time to, to have an in-depth discussion with them about, about whatever it is that, that's concerning them, uh, and know that you know that they're not worrying about 209,099 other people <laughs> um, when, they're, when they're trying to follow through on, on what they promised uh, their constituents. So from a representation and access perspective, I think five commissioners districted would be a really great benefit to the, to the county. Um, people have raised the question about costs. Um, and you know, okay, you add two commissioners. That adds, um, my, my, my two fellow commissioners voted themselves a, a pretty substantial pay increase last year. So if someone came in at the pay level that uh, um, my two fellow commissioners are at, it would add $250,000 of salary plus benefits um, to the county budget. And you might ask, you know, is that worth it? You know, but by the way, I didn't, I didn't take that, um, I didn't take that raise. Uh, I thought it was really inappropriate on a, on a, in a year when we were facing uh, new serious fiscal austerity and trying to tighten our belts. I thought it was inappropriate for my fellow commissioners to vote themselves a $14,000 raise. Uh, but you know, is it worth it to have to pay that pay those additional costs? Um, I think with a couple of more brains on the county commission, uh, we could do a much better job of managing our budget and be much more fiscally responsible. Um, and when you're talking about a four hundred million dollar operating budget, um, that better fiscal management uh, could pay off in spades. Great, thank you. Can we rebut that? Um, we have more time for that. I think we're going to try to get That's to one fine. more question before we break. So I'll answer it next time. Sounds great. Okay. Uh, yeah, hold that for the next time. Thanks, Rob. Um, so we have about seven minutes. So let's stretch it out and say about two minutes per person. I changed this question because I think it'll be a little bit shorter than the one that I was going to ask because we want to keep things conversational and we appreciate the conversation going. Um, but we are going to take the break at 7 and then come back at around 7.10 um, with the questions that you all put in. Um, so the landfill. Um, where do you think it should be located? And if you haven't decided yet, can you tell us how you would make that decision? So kind of keep briefly to around two minutes. We'll start with you, Brian. Okay. Well, I haven't decided where I would want a landfill located, but uh, I would seriously look at what infrastructure is located nearby, how close it is to schools, what the traffic patterns are. Um, I certainly would look at who or how many private landowners are there around there that are going to be directly affected by putting in a landfill. Uh, it's kind of one of those things, it's okay to put it in your backyard, but I don't want it in my backyard, and that's just how a lot of people would feel about it. So I think that we gotta be real careful. We need to assess, one, who's impacted by it? Two, what is the cost gonna be? Why are we putting it there? Would it be better someplace else than to be running trash trucks and increasing the traffic and increasing the hazards? Um, I don't know how many times I've stopped just before going into a roundabout because a trash truck had stopped to pick up some garbage and so, and then you got the roundabout. 
But anyway, I really feel that it is very important to take careful consideration based on who's there, who's it's going to impact, and what are the costs going to be, and are we going to be looking at this thing someday going, oh, God, I wish you hadn't put it there. Great. Thank you. Uh, Judy. So Deschutes County is running out of space in their landfill. We need to recite that location. I am not an expert in citing landfills, but I will say I saw the two locations and I did map them out and the Moon Pit location did seem better uh, to me just because of where that is located. It is going to cost $8 million to shut down the old landfill and it's going to cost $20 million to put in the new one. And so to answer your question quickly, um, Moon Pit is where I think it should go. Unless an expert tells me different. Thank you, Judy, for your quick answer. I see Ryan smiling back there. He, he is helping with the analysis for our potential landfill sites. Um, at this point, we are down to two sites. Um, I wish earlier in the process, number one, uh, that we had been doing more to divert waste from our landfill so that we had a little bit more time. Uh, to, to work with before our landfill will be full and before we desperately needed this new site. I also wish that we had uh, worked a little harder on potential sites that are closer to where we're generating all the waste because we are going to spend a whole lot of money hauling a whole lot of waste, you know, tens of trucks per day, way out into East County. Um, so I, you know, I, I was pretty disappointed by that, uh, personally. Um, but with the two sites that we have remaining, uh, there's a site called Roth East, there's another site um, called the Moon Pit. Uh, the Moon Pit is already a very large hole in the ground. So uh, in terms of the impacts you would cause by digging a very large hole in the ground, um, those impacts uh, are substantially already there. Um, and, you know, there will be uh, some additional excavation in that site, uh, you know, to, to, to get more mineral resource before, you know, that mineral resource is exhausted. I think that, that that's a pretty good site, um, you know, among the two that we have left. The other site uh, has, um, a, a, there's a number of concerns. The, the private landowners um, nearby that um, um, Brian mentioned our concern. Um, it's really close to Pine Mountain, um, which is a, you know, a very beloved uh, location for a lot of people in our community uh, as, a, as a place to visit. Um, and, you know, the dust, the noise, um, the lights potentially it could have an impact on Pine Mountain Observatory. And um, the other thing about uh, the Rothy site is there is uh, a whole lot of really important sage grouse habitat really close to there. And, you know, sage grouse is a, is a really important, uh, used to be a really important game species um, uh, across the Intermountain West that lots of people really like to eat. Um, and now uh, they are uh, on, at risk of becoming uh, listed under the Endangered Species Act. So. Um, the proximity to the sage grouse habitat, I think, is, a, is another strike against the, the uh, Roth East site. And um, so I, I would say of what, with what we've got left, uh, the moon pit is my personal favorite. Rob? I don't necessarily have a favorite because garbage isn't my favorite. <laughs> However, <laughs> um, moon pit probably makes the most sense from a design perspective and also maybe a uh, environmental impact statement if you were looking at both of those conditions solely but I will also tell you I have friends out uh, Rickard Road I have friends east of town that um, they're not super thrilled with the dump coming out by them anyway um, I know that the Bureau of Land Management just had a land transfer uh, that isn't official yet but I believe it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 480 acres that um, should have been ours from the beginning of statehood and then eventually they've corrected it um, that's out by some of my friends who live out in Sundance and live on that side of town. And their biggest fear is that that's going to be where the dump goes because it's the most logical 
just up the road kind of site. Um, obviously, I have uh, no authority to even make a decision on it, um, but I would say that um, I do know that there are um, certain counties that have offered and asked for us to send their, our garbage to them. Um, I don't know what that looks like. I would agree with, with Phil's sentiment that reducing garbage should be a priority. Um, I think that uh, based on some testimony in the commission yesterday, they talked about um, we have a, a ton of, of really good um, mulching byproduct that would free up some space at the existing dump. But then what do you do with styrofoam? What do you do with, so there's, there's a few different things. You have legislators that should be having discussions with packagers about how to reduce waste and make waste that we can ultimately recycle with. So that's kind of my um, two cents, whatever it's worth. Sounds great. Okay, hey, we're gonna- could, could, I, could I actually just- uh, Well, we're over time. So we're gonna um, hold it until you can make a rebuttal later, if you will. Um, uh, just and really quickly, I would say uh, my, my, my fellow candidates here should should research the Recycling Modernization Act that was passed a couple of years ago for the state of Oregon. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, we are going to take a break now, and we will take the um, audience questions and the people online, yep. and we'll come back with those questions yep. uh, about 710. So enjoy your break, and we'll see you then. And thank you, audience. You've been...
interactive. Wow. And moderators, when you are ready, you may begin. Okay. I'd like to talk about water. Now, first of all, is this Judy starts? Is that we just did Brian, now yep. we're to Judy? Okay. Water. We're in a drought. We've been in one for a long time. If you look at uh, Primeville Reservoir, you wouldn't think so. So there is hope. But there is surface water and there's groundwater. So we have surface water issues with our irrigation districts and our, our agriculture. And we've got groundwater issues with our cities and with our rural residential who live on wells. The groundwater has dropped, I think, 15 feet, which is causing challenges to people. Talk about water and what do you think the impact and what we should do moving forward uh, to, to address these issues? Well, water in Deschutes County is a finite resource. There have been declines in our water, in our groundwater, and not to be too disparaging, but the Oregon Water Resources Department strategic plan for water is to issue permits till we run out of it, I guess. So they are talking about moving forward with the integrated water strategy. The groundwater is being depleted because of drought, pumping, and piping canals. Those are the three reasons that our groundwater is depleting. So they want to, the Oregon Water Resources Department wants to restrict permits going forward. And they are proposing that unless you can prove that there's a stable water system, the answer is going to be no. Before, it was an automatic yes almost. And so they're kind of flipping um, their strategy. The problem I have with it is with the cities. And I testified at that meeting in opposition because the cities do not get an exemption. So when we talk about workforce housing, affordable housing, and trying to grow the urban growth boundaries around the cities, they have no options. If they cannot drill a new well, if they cannot have access to water, they cannot put in workforce or affordable housing. Now, some people would say, fine, most people I know say, fine, we don't want any more building here anyway. There's too many people, the infrastructure isn't, you know, but when I look at everything through the lens of how it impacts someone of limited means, the single parent, the chef in the restaurant, someone working retail, and so we do need housing for them. And so to increase that housing, we really need to work with the Water Resources Department. I think there should be exemption. So just so you know, 80% of the water that is diverted is for agriculture. So 10% is for municipalities, and the other 10% is for commercial use. So when we talk about waters, water and cities, the, it, from my perspective, the cities are very low. Um, they're, they're just not that big of an impact on the water system. So I believe that, yes, we can conserve and we can rip out all our lawns, but that's 10% of the water that's diverted. So when we look at agriculture, we do need to look at upgrading, putting in cover crops. There are market-based solutions um, to helping farmers and ranchers conserve water, and it, it is going on all over the country. And so the, the benefit for farmers and ranchers is they can double their crop production if they do these simple things. It helps with carbon because if the soil is great soil, it captures the CO2 and it's in the plants and the soils instead of going into the air. So it helps with that. So I think we really need to coordinate with the farming community and figure out ways. It's, it's really difficult mostly for North Unit it comes down from Wikia, but goes through eight irrigation districts, and their um, priority is higher 
to the south. And so by the time it gets to North Unit, they don't have any water left. So we really do need to work with the irrigation districts. I think we can have the irrigation districts come up with water agreements where they can share water if they agree to. And we can also make sure and ensure that farms and ranches can either lease or sell their water without losing their water rights. Thank you, Judy. You're welcome. And you notice we have a timer. It's oh, a thank four you. minute timer. It's a, water's so a big you long just deal. Right. Okay. okay, Phil. Okay, um, so water resources is something that I've worked on for uh, decades. Um, water resources professional by training and um, have been involved in uh, water, water conservation efforts in the basin uh, for about 20 years. Um, because I, I'm, a, because a lot of people recognize that I try to uh, meet everyone's needs, all, all of the diverse users of water in the basin, um, the stakeholders of the Deschutes Basin asked me to be one of the co-chairs of uh, a group called the Deschutes Basin Water Collaborative. So uh, irrigation districts, fish and frog lovers, um, cities, other users of water all, you know, all said, well, would you be a co-chair for this uh, water collaborative with uh, Bobby Bruno uh, from the Warm Springs Tribes and uh, Steve Johnson from the Arnold Irrigation District. The thing to understand uh, about, about water in this basin is that there's a surface water story and there's a groundwater story. Uh, surface, the surface water story is that um, the, the rivers themselves and all the, all the fish and wildlife, the farmers depend upon surface water and uh, there's been tension between those two uses for, for many decades. The way we solve that is by saving water in agriculture. Uh, so we pipe canals, so we don't have to divert as much water out of the, out of the river, and we do on-farm efficiency, some of the things that, that, that Judy was, was outlining for you. So on-farm efficiency and canal piping saves tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of acre feet of water in agriculture making the supplies more reliable for farmers uh, and for the river. Groundwater as a whole done their story. Uh, the major users of groundwater in the Deschutes Basin are, uh, are homes and businesses and cities. So all agricultural, uh, agriculture doesn't, it barely uses any groundwater in the Deschutes Basin. It's very unique, other basins, uh, groundwater, a lot of groundwater use is agricultural. So, um, we have witnessed declines uh, in some, in, you know, in some places, you know, right here in Bend, not far from here, there's a well that's declined 50 feet. Um, generally, Bend-Redmond area, we see declines, um, you know, maybe 20, 25 feet. Uh, it's, it's significant. Uh, and we have seen a bunch of individual domestic wells, what are called exempt wells, uh, go dry just in the three years that I've been uh, county commissioner. About, I, I'd count uh, probably, I've heard about at least 200. Uh, so groundwater level declines are a real concern. Um, how do we get groundwater levels to stop declining or how do we slow those declines? Um, that's what the, the groundwater allocation rulemaking that Judy mentioned is trying to get at. Uh, Water Resources Department was issuing groundwater permits for many years without knowing whether the groundwater was actually there. Uh, they're trying to reverse that now and they're saying, okay, we're not going to issue any new permits in basins where groundwater levels have declined significantly. Um, and it's kind of like using a, a hatchet when you need a scalpel. Um, it's, a, it's a very crude, simplistic way of cutting people off. The problem with this is, number one, uh, it's the current users of groundwater um, in combination with drought um, that are causing the groundwater levels to decline. So you, you can cut off new permits, but our groundwater levels are gonna continue to decline. You may, it may not accelerate if you cut off new permits, but those, those groundwater levels are gonna continue to decline. 
the way that we address the decline, we slow or maybe even reverse the decline, is by um, having people, existing users of groundwater conserve. Uh, and that means, you know, if, if groundwater users in our basin are um, our homes, our businesses, et cetera, that means, you know, all of us, you know, at little, tiny, you know, household scales need to save a bunch of water in order to slow or reverse these declines. Thank you. So <clears throat> I think the first thing we have to do is dismiss the fear narrative. Um, I talked to a lot of people who have wells that have dried up but I believe that the solution um, is, is also directly related to the problem. Since we started piping canals, we have a measurable drastic reduction in uh, surface and groundwater wells depending on their depth. So speaking to uh, one of the hydro, um, hydrogeologists in town um, who has studied the, the, our basin, which is extremely unique and, and, and arguably the most studied basin probably in the US, um, just because it's super unique in the way that water travels and how long it takes for the snow melt to actually hit our aquifer and then how long that water takes to get to the north side of our county and dump out of the gateway. So what I'll tell you is that um, there is a lot of information out there that does one of two things. One of them says if you take your existing well and it's a, a surface water well, let's say it's at 180 feet, and you drill down another 200 feet you will likely hit the aquifer. The aquifer goes from um, basically the, the Metolius and Green Ridge drainages, which is like it's a subbasin. It goes all the way uh, uh, to um, the east side, the Polinas. It goes north-south. It goes Lapine, uh, uh, Klamath um, County interchange, and it goes all the way to where it dumps out of the gateway just above the crossing bridge in Warm Springs. So when you understand the size of that and you understand how much water is in it, there's a study in 1994. Um, they were actually testing uh, for a um, element called tritium that was released by, in the atmosphere by the US government when they were testing nuclear, they were doing aerial testing and atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons. It fell in the form of rainfall and snowfall. It ended up hitting it. Well, when they tested Opal Springs, they found, because the, they, you can test between natural tritium and the tritium that was artificially made through the nuclear uh, testing. And they found tritium there, which means, and that was in 94, which means that that water they tested was at least 40 years old. In order to have tritium in it, at that level, where it was, had to be at least 40 years old. Now, a lot of it, there's, there's some differing opinion on how, how much water we actually sit on. But I've heard anywhere from 40 years to 100 years worth of supply in our aquifer that's constantly being recharged. So people who have been told you have no way to access the water that you're, that you're living, uh, or that you're relying on for life, you have no way to access it because you're at 180 feet. Um, maybe as a county, and maybe as the various water boards and the irrigation districts, maybe there needs to be a stronger emphasis on helping those people, need-based, especially those that are on fixed incomes, to get down to where they need to so that their straw is deep enough into the aquifer that they don't have to concern themselves with fluctuating flows of water. That being said, um, we cannot dismiss juniper and its effect on water. A juniper will <coughs> drink anywhere from 50 to 70 gallons of water per day. There are numerous tests done by unbiased scientists in uh, the Crooked River Basin right now that is about juniper abatement and its effect on flow rates. There is a direct correlation between cutting junipers down and having increased flow in our ground and surface water. So my suggestion, that, uh, and then let me, let me add one more point because I know I'm almost out of time. Um, there was a proposition. One of the friends of mine who is a farmer was explaining to me that uh, he only, with, when the canals were open, he would get 70% of his allotted water. So 70 uh, acre feet, his allotment was 100 acre feet, so 30 was being lost. They piped the canal. The minute they piped their canal, the canal within a day, his surface well dried up. Could it be chance? You could maybe find an argument for it. However, then what happened is he went back to the water irrigation district and said, hey, I got an idea. So many people rely on this surface water to get recharged through the canal system that's now going away. 
why don't we throw a perforated pipe right alongside the, the main pipe, the delivery pipe, so that when the water districts shut water off of the canal system for farming, they flip it over to the perforated pipe and it recharges everybody's surface wells. It's logical, the hole's already dug, but what he told me is he said, what you don't understand is that I still only get 70% of my water because the other 30% rips right on by. And it goes, it, and, and improves water flow because that's the, that's the discussion. So I would always say you gotta find out A, who creates the study and B, who is, uh, stands the most to benefit. Thank you, Rob. Yes. Brian. Thank you. Yes, sir. Honestly, I don't think that I could add a whole lot to the young man's statement. <laughs> but where, where I'm at with this, that finding ways to conserve the water, water storage on the ranches, using water that is not used correctly, you know, dispersing the water on the land that it really isn't doing anything. Um, I think we're taking a valuable resource and we're just, we're just putting it out there and it, there's no return on it. So I think that we really have to consider that and um, other than everything that has been suggested, uh, piping the water, conserving the water, storing the water, um, working in conjunction with, with the landowners, the county, all of it. And uh, that's important. I really don't have a whole lot more to say or add to what everyone what else has said. Speaking? Yeah, and I wanted to get rebuttals, but I, we don't have time for that. So okay. let's uh, move to the next one. Um, I, I just, I'm going to try to combine a few questions from the audience here as best I can. Commissioner Chang, we'll start with you. Um, quite a few were about uh, Measure 110 and the changes and drug law in yeah. Oregon. Um, can you talk about um, how you see the county's uh, role in handling, enforcing drug law, uh, dealing with fentanyl? Um, what county, how should county resources uh, be spent in light of the modifications? Yeah, um, very important question. Measure 110. So. Uh, before Measure 110, we had, uh, we had a system where there was insufficient treatment capacity and insufficient funding for treatment capacity, and we didn't have good drivers to get people into treatment. When we got Measure 110, uh, we got funding for treatment capacity, and we still didn't have good drivers to get people into treatment. Now, with House Bill 4002 that the, the state legislature just passed. Um, we keep the, the Measure 110 funding to, to, to support treatment capacity. And uh, the legislature has created this new uh, special misdemeanor that uh, is intended to drive people into treatment um, through a process called deflection. So uh, before, you know, or, earlier in earlier iterations um, we saw opportunities for someone who was uh, you know had committed crimes who uh, had an addiction problem in Deschutes County that person might have an opportunity to get diverted out of the justice system when they're pretty far along you know through our adult treatment court um, we had this great adult treatment court rehabilitated a lot of people, kept a lot of people from going to jail, got them successfully through treatment and clean and sober. It was super expensive. Um, and the, the system collapsed under its own weight, basically. It, too, it took too many resources to salvage someone at that point along the way in their trajectory of uh, substance, you know, substance use disorder and, and crime. This new special mes misdemeanor, if it works, is going to catch people really early, really early in their addiction process, really early in their criminal behavior, deflect them out uh, and get them into treatment early. So they will have the opportunity to not even go to court if uh, they 
agree to go to treatment and, and complete treatment. Uh, at the county level, we are going to need to set up a good deflection system. Uh, and I'm super excited to see uh, our, our, you know, uh, many county departments work together to create that system. We're going to need uh, the Community Justice uh, Department, the Parole and Probation Division within the Community Justice Department. We're going to need uh, our deputy DAs. Um, you know, the, the DA is a state as a state official, but um, his whole staff are county employees. Um, we're going to need behavioral health specialists. Um, from the county involved in that system. And, and uh, frankly, uh, so far the, the real leadership in setting up this deflection system has been coming from the behavioral health division at the county. And we're going to need law enforcement. You know, I, I see, uh, I see uh, Captain Bailey in the back there. Um, we're going to need uh, our sheriff's office and we're going to need our, um, uh, our, our police departments across the region all working together to create a deflection system that works. I, I just want to say that um, I was the commissioner who uh, wanted the county to sign on to the policy proposal from the sheriffs, the police chiefs, the DAs of the state and the League of Oregon Cities to create uh, the and, you know the the bill House Bill two thousand four thousand and two that we got. You know the, my my fellow commissioners were uh, they 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 wanted something different, um, uh, but I think uh, that this is a really exciting uh, policy package. I hope it's going to work, uh, and I'm going to make sure that Deschutes County does its best to make sure that it does. Great, thank you, Mr. Imhoff. How would you use county resources to um, enforce? Oregon drug law, how would you help people, uh, how would you help people get help? Okay, so a couple things. Um, I think that it was a mistake to not have a unanimous commission on declaring a fentanyl emergency in an obvious state of emergency that we find in our county. Again, we can disagree without being disagreeable, right? So there's reasons, everybody has their reasons, Personally, I would have declared, I would have gone along with both Patty and Tony and declared an emergency because I feel like that opens up a whole other level of funding and support. Now, that being said, to Phil's point, funding matters. So how do we get, money just does not grow on trees even though we believe that as kids. We know we have to get the money somewhere. That's where efficiency in government comes in. That's where you're not dipping your hand in the pockets of the people. You're finding ways within your current budget to trim and, and make a, a more efficient style of government. That's my solution. That's kind of where I would think that I, I would fit. Specifically regarding 110, um, it is an unclassified misdemeanor is what they're calling it. So an unclassified misdemeanor versus being A, B, or C. Um, some of the knock was that if you didn't make it a class A, then you would not have the ability to mandate court mandate um, treatment. Critical that you are able to mandate that treatment because a lot of times addicts don't want to admit that they're addicts until they hit a bottom. We need that bottom to be found in court. So once we find that bottom in court and we give our judiciary the latitude to mandate, because right now it's supposed to be a, a, a potential jail time of uh, 30 days for probation violations um, or 180 days if they revoke probation. Um, I know a lot of deputies that are in the, in the jail system right now that will tell you that um, without treatment, it is a very difficult job with the addic addiction and mental health that they, are, that they see coming into the prison every day. Um, and, you know what, as a commissioner, it's my job to make sure that the people who work for the county love their job. And if the deputies don't love their job, because we haven't done enough to try to mitigate the influx of mentally ill and drug addicted people, then we haven't done our job, plain and simple. Um, I would love to have a judiciary and empower them and say, hey, look, we need you to be the ones. And then we also, we have to make sure, to Phil's point, we've got to make sure that we have services in place, that we're not just promising something that we can't deliver on. 
but it does require, I believe it requires a lot of, um, a lot of co cooperation between counties because we're kind of all in this thing together. Because whether we like it or not, the entire county, uh, the entire state is overrun by everything from drug addiction to mental health to homeless tourism. And until we create the correlation between those three, because there is a correlation, not always, not always, but often, there's a correlation between homelessness, mental health, and drug addiction. And that comes from people who are in, on the ground every single day. Um, I, I, I had the pleasure of talking to a couple guys who um, everything they do is for the largest uh, homeless population in Oregon, which is across from the Capitol in Salem down on the river. And they are down there every single day mixing it up. They were former addicts, they were former homeless. They were former drug dealers, they were former criminals. They kind of hit all the spots. And, and the truth is, is that until people want to change, they won't. Um, even if you force them, I mean, you take somebody and put them in a treatment and they don't want to be there, they'll check the boxes, but when they get out, they're gonna jump right back into it because they don't want to change. So the idea is we have to get them in a mentally stable state so they can start to make some good decisions and really contribute to our society the way that they should. Thank you. Thank you. Brian. Well, I think, I think originally it was a bad idea to implement the 110 law. Uh, it created a lot of no accountability. You go out, you use, use drugs, you commit a crime, and that would have been a crime that you were committing by having a certain amount of drugs in your possession. But then the state took that penalty away. And then so what's going on right now is a consequence of that. Fentanyl is the leading cause of death for children from age 16 all the way up to, I believe it's around 40 two or 44 years, years of age. And uh, it's, it's a crisis uh, all over the country. You know, and not to make it, sure, let's, l let's give them counseling. Let's help them out that way. Providing funds for that, it's, it's necessary. But I don't feel, as a counselor, I've been exposed to this, that it's very hard to, to just counsel them out of use. One, they, they have to want to. They have to have time enough to detox, get that out of their system. And if that's not done, they don't want to hear it. And then if they have the opportunity to go back out on the street just after they were they were arrested for it, then it's not going to do any good. I've I've seen addicts that will they'll get they'll get off of heroin or other opioids, and the next thing you know, they're they're using meth, and uh, so there's a rationalization there that they have that that, that yeah I. You know, I'm, I'm not really using the fentanyl, but I need the meth to keep me relaxed and uh, be able to to uh, have a have a a conversation with somebody. So, I think the treatment idea is good. I think arresting them for possession of a certain amount of fentanyl or other drugs should be mandatory and I also think that incarceration in the early phases of their treatment is important because if they're not held they'll go right back out on the street and there's nothing to prevent them from from not doing that so I'm all for the penalties, I'm also for the treatment, but honestly, it's really hard to 
have someone that's an addict to show accountability. And you need to monitor that, especially in the early days of treatment. Then you can go on to the next phase. And when you start rewarding them, well, maybe they can after a period of time and they can show that they've got clean urine tests and they're accountable to their families because there's a lot of families I'm sorry yeah thank you a lot of families that are you know impacted by their addiction thank you good choices yeah Judy. 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 thank you and so I think every person in this room knows someone who struggled with drugs or alcohol the health department helps find ways to provide pathways out of addiction. The county health department is an $80 million department and a majority of their funding comes from federal and state to deal with these issues. When I look at addiction, I look at how it impacts the community, impacts the person, it creates poverty. There is a whole host of serve of, of consequences around a person who is addicted. I was recently approached by a family member to, to, and asked to help with this problem. And what I found when I tried to help this person was they got a job right away, they got back into the workforce, they got off drugs really quick, but when we went to do the alcohol part, it took three months to get them into best care. So when someone's struggling with de um, alcohol or drugs, we need treatment services that are immediate. Our county jail is the front line for treatment right now. They are dealing with so many, I mean, I've had to call Bill and his police officers many times outside of my office because of people just out of control on drugs. And we cannot allow people on the streets the way we've seen them acting. Just, it's just very, very sad. As a county, what we need to do is help stabilize the health department's funding stream. We need to increase and fund stabilization centers, have treatment and detox capacity, and we need to prioritize adequate and stable funding. I do agree with the drug courts. I think they were very helpful in getting people help before they end up in the prison system. And I understand the issues around marijuana if you have cancer and or MS or any of those diseases that you are eligible to smoke marijuana for. I mean, I was in favor of that because I thought, I don't wanna pay $50,000 a year to keep somebody in jail for smoking pot. But when I see what's happened over the years, I mean, I've totally changed my mind because it is a gateway drug and it's kind of gone just out of control. We are in a crisis. We do need to prioritize our mental health dollars and our mental, our, our Department of Health is really doing a great job of bringing in the funding. I'm concerned about the stable funding going forward. So we really need to focus on that and that is my one of my number one priorities. Great, thank you. Um, well, we, we're running out of time and we have tons of incredible questions from all of you. Um, so we can either do a lightning round, which I don't know we're going to be very successful at, or... Um, it's not going to happen, though. Sherry. It could be fun. <laughs> that won't happen. Um, or we can do closing statements, because that's really all the time I think that we have left, and that would be probably about a minute and a half for closing statements. I will let you know there was a lot of questions Maybe you want to incorporate some of them into your closing statement on um, housing. There's a lot of concern in this, this room around affordable housing, housing for um, working folks and middle class as well. Um, and then there was the most amount of questions 
were written about how are you going to um, make your campaign not divisive, um, the you know unifying our community as opposed to dividing it, and how will you work with um, Tony and um, our, our Commissioner Adair and Commissioner DeBone on um, issues you disagree with. So those are the questions that I think cover about half of the questions that we haven't gotten to. Um, so you can do with it what you want. Um, I just wanted to make sure you heard the sentiment of the folks that have been sitting in front of you for a couple hours. Chime for two minutes for each person. Um, Mr. Imhoff, we'll start with oh, you. Oh, I get to start? Maybe. Yeah. Uh, well, a couple things. So uh, as far as housing, I'm just going to take a poll. Raise your hand if you own a house. Raise your hand if you can afford to buy that house today. <laughs> okay. Raise your hand if you moved here to live in an apartment. That was your that was your hope, or that's just where you ended up. Just making sure because it's an important question. I don't know anybody that I talked to that said I moved here to live in an apartment. Now I think I met two. I know, but a lot of people they moved to Central Oregon because they're in love with what Central Oregon is, and sometimes an apartment gets in the way of that. Sometimes it doesn't. But I don't know very many people. Can I can I say that without offending you at all, Darcy? Okay, good. Um, so I would tell you this: it's my responsibility as a commissioner to try to create housing opportunities for anybody who wants to own a home. There are some really good organizations out there right now. I know that Phil met with some yesterday, I believe. Rooted Homes. There's some. There, there's a lot of opportunities. I have a friend of mine that's doing a pretty big development in Lapine that's more affordable. Um, I think that end of the day, people want a little bit of a yard. <laughs> they don't. They don't want it. They didn't move to Central Oregon to live on the concrete. They just want a little bit of yard. They maybe want some native plants. Maybe they want a lawn. I don't know. We can talk about water and say you get this much lawn, but they want a yard. They want to dream. They want to hope for something better. Thirty seconds. I will tell you that as your next county commissioner, I intend to deliver on these promises. I will give you principal leadership. I will always rule from the heart. And I will always be honest with you. I won't lie to you and I won't lie to myself. That's the only thing I can do. As a business owner, I think I can help satisfy some of the frustrations that we're having over a, a budget that is sometimes seen as out of control. Thank you. Thank you. Brian, two minutes. Well, there's a lot of things that I would like to see, mostly I would like to see people in Deschutes County have that feeling that they're, they're safe. I think that's a big issue. Uh, also that they have confidence in people that are supposed to be protecting them. You know, we've had in recent years, we've had a beautiful college student that we lost. We lost to someone who was supposed to be trusted. And I think we all are aware of who that was. I don't want to ever see that situation again. I think it's really important that people that are in positions of power need to be properly vetted I feel that very strongly. They need to, we need to be sure that they have our best interests at heart. And that is the position that I am running on as your county commissioner. I will have your best interest at heart. And I will do my seconds. utmost not to let you down. So that's really it in a nutshell. I'll do my best. Thank you. Judy, two minutes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> On the question about working with the county commissioners, I've worked with three different board of county commissioners over the last 20 years, Democrats, Republicans, and gotten a lot of things done. This is about people and not about politics. And I think being able to work with the current county commissioners, even if you disagree with them, 
I would be respectful towards them. I would listen to their concerns. And we might not always vote the same, but at least we would understand how each other felt in a respectful way. Um, on the housing issue, the cost of land is the issue with housing. The county owns land and the county can have a big impact on affordable and workforce housing through working with our nonprofit partners and through providing land either at a discount or lease or there's other programs that are happening all over the country. My three priorities will be to solve the homeless crisis in Deschutes County, to increase mental health services, and to address our lack of affordable and workforce housing. And I've worked in all three of those areas. I've built trust over 25 years of doing this work, and I will work with private and public sector individuals to get these things done. 30 seconds. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry. Commissioner Chang. I'm asking for your vote for a Deschutes County where the people who work in our community can afford to live here, where we have homes we love and we don't have to sacrifice our farms, our forests, and our high, high desert to get those homes, where we lead the state in helping people who are struggling with addiction or mental health challenges, in recovering uh, and reintegrating into our community, where we are safe from both wildfire and outrageous insurance premiums, where there is enough water for our farms, our forests, uh, our farms, our rivers, our homes, uh, and our businesses, and where there are enough parks, trails, play spots along the river uh, for both residents and our many visitors. Tonight, you've heard a lot of slogans, um, a, lot of, a lot of buzzwords. Um, what I offer to the people of Deschutes County is real solutions. I have uh, an in-depth understanding of the problems that we face. I have relationships with all of the focal folks who are, uh, who are critical, um, critical in helping us solve problems. Uh, and I will use that knowledge, um, and I will use those relationships, and I will use my moral compass uh, and my commitment to the people of Deschutes County to solve those problems. Thank you. Thank you. A round of applause for all our <laughs> candidates. And, and pat yourself on the back. Yeah, and I would really like to give you all a round of applause for our audience because in this time when, as you mentioned in your questions, it's a very divisive um, environment politically, you all were the greatest audience I've seen in a long time. So let's give them a round of applause. Cool. Thank you all for attending. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good job, bud. Good job, guys. Hey, thank you. Thanks, Alan. Thank you, guys.